mechanism at large in a very simple way. Uh, you know, in our Excel sheet for the Taipei Biennial, the fact that money was being invested in these fees meant it couldn't be invested elsewhere. Um, and if an initiative like WAGE were to become successful on, uh, on an international level, and it's not completely unrealistic, um, you know, you could, you could dismiss it as a minor, uh, you know, bureaucratic tweaking of business as usual. But I have the feeling that it would actually lead to a chain reaction that um, both reconsiders what artist labor is in a theoretical and ideological sense and historical sense, um, but also to an effective um, slowing down of the, the apparatus at large. And um, I think that a slowing down would, a number of the, the, the issues I've been complaining about over the last hour um, cannot really be tackled in a serious way without this culture of, of overproduction um, at least being you know, toned down somewhat. And um, I know that Canada is, uh, is a reference for a wage. Um, I wouldn't dare pass judgment on the pros and cons thereof because probably everybody in this room uh, knows the advantages and disadvantages better than I do. Uh, but to those who don't um, live and work in Canada, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, uh, an encouragement to see that there is something in place that ensures uh, a minimum of, of accountability. Is that your question, or should I? Can I ask a follow-up on the media? Do I need the mic? Okay. Maybe I misinterpreted you, but I thought when you—I thought the media comment was you tried to keep the coverage of the twenty-four artists balanced in terms of, uh, or was it holding the or trying to keep the media coverage itself balanced in how they wrote about the? No, the thing, the thing about uh, the bigger the show is the larger the, 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 the figure of the curator looms above everything else because the, the curator becomes the, the, you know, the, the more dispersed the priorities of the artists, the more the figure of the curator becomes the only possible common denominator that the media will flock to. And so this already uh, sucks up a lot of the attention and these 120 artists and many biennials run 120 artists or more um, are, you know, they, they, they have precious little uh, hope of uh, contributing to the discourse. Um, and when they do, it often sparks a, a spirit of competitiveness between the artists um, because you start to speculate, um, why did he get the mic and, and I did not? Um, and it can get quite um, ugly. Um, so we just we just assumed that if there if it's you know if it's twenty as opposed to one hundred and twenty, obviously this would be slightly more balanced. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. I don't, I'm just gonna bounce up an idea. Well, one was about the burning up cop cars as somehow being more radical or more real than the artists doing something symbolic or political within the biennial itself. And I guess I feel like the burning of a cop car is equally of a convention and a formality or an etiquette as it is to be in a bunker making formal gestures. Like it's part of the same convention as for the artist to be outside of politics in that kind of street front kind of way. Um, then I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Sharjah Baniel with the boycott. Because as Jack Persekian was fired, um, there was a boycott by two of the, by assistant curator and a curator and not the other curator, right? So there was a kind of a division. And then later on it came out that Jack was against the uh, boycott itself, or the signing of the boycott. 
um, which and later on I've been hearing that it has more to do with the fact that um, Jack wanted to create an autonomy of the curator and the, found, and the, and the um, biennials relationship to the uh, ruling family basically, or the board. Uh, but more than that, I'm interested in how this boycott happened, which was, you know, a kind of a, a, a trying to be a radical gesture. But in fact, and a lot of artists signed this petition, which I think right now boycotts for artists are interesting because the signature is, the, you know, the one that signs the painting is equally as powerful as the one for artists in particular because that's all we have essentially. Um, but then the next year, the Sharjah Biennial hired a powerful curator and called it kind of a, the show was called Courtyards. And all, a lot of the artists who were actually on the boycott came back to the watering hole and were participating in the shows. And then now that Anju Ju has been nominated to curate the next show and she comes with a lot of clout, a lot of the artists who were part of this supporting of these, um, you know, the Lebanese art scene and so on and so forth are actually big um, frontiers of this new biennial. So there's a kind of a contradiction there where it actually rendered the boycott really benign in some ways. But I might be wrong, so I'm wondering if you know a little bit about it. Um, the, um, just, just a quick response to what you were saying about the burning cop cars. I, I hope I made it clear that I completely agree with you. I was talking about the, uh, the way that this contrast is perceived as one being inconsequential, like art being the place where an actor screams fire on the stage, uh, and the other being the, the place of the real. Um, and I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. The burning of a cop car is an aesthetic phenomenon uh, that is actually folkloric in terms of you know, the visual the traditions that it subscribes to it and so forth. Um, the Sharjah Biennial, um, yeah, I don't, I don't um, again, maybe I'll quickly summarize for those of you who don't know the, the, st the story. Um, uh, a work in uh, the, the Biennial of 2010, was it? Uh, no, it can't have been, 2011 probably. Um, was considered um, offensive towards uh, certain religious sentiments. And um, it turned out that this work had been just standing around in the biennial for weeks before it was discovered. And mainly because there were 120 artists in the show. Um, and <laughs> the... Uh, not the curators um, who are, you know, gasta baita anyway, who, you know, fly in for the project and leave. But the director, Jack Persikian, uh, was fired as a result of this. And um, uh, as mentioned, there was a petition that popped up um, which, which protested against uh, this, um, this move and which... Uh, had a, a, a protest which, which had a very short shelf life, as you were saying yourself. Um, and um, I think that the curator who was brought in for the next, I, I actually wrote a, a piece in Freeze right after that incident, uh, naively saying that uh, Sharjah, which by the way is a place that I'm, I feel very invested in and that I think is very important for uh, the Middle Eastern uh, contemporary art field in various ways, but I was saying, I was naively saying that it's now morally bankrupt. Um, and little did I know that three years later um, it would be considered a high ground of criticality all over again. Um, I think that the, uh, the Biennial Foundation was smart, not, in, not by bringing in a curator who was influential, but a curator who came from afar not just geographically, but also curatorially, being very uninterested in the whole topic um, and thereby sidestepping that conversation with relative ease. Um, and now with, with Unji, I mean, I, I can't, I don't really have an answer. I'm, I'm um, or at least not an answer that would not sound cynical. Um, but I myself, I'm, I'm pretty surprised um, by the, the, the ease with which this institutional history can be simply sidestepped. And um, 
I recently conducted an interview with uh, one of the organizers of the petition um, where I gently confronted him with the fact that how come he's, he's back? Um, and this is, uh, I may as well say, because the interview is going to be printed online very shortly, it's uh, with uh, uh, the artist uh, Yazan Khalili, who was one of the uh, coordinators of the Sharjah Biennial at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he said that his, his, his intention had never been to, um, had never been to, uh, you know, destroy the socio-cultural capital of the, of, of Sharjah, um, but to make it harder for this to happen again. So kind of a slap on the wrist. And, um, yeah, you know, I don't, <laughs> I think that 10 years ago, maybe that, that, um, that would have made more sense because there was such, so little hope within the contemporary art field for really being able to uh, leave a, a lasting impression on institutions such as Sharjah. But again, just like uh, what I was saying about Istanbul earlier, I think that now we're entering a, a very different climate. And, um, and the fact that in, in Sharjah this, this whole thing is being treated with such nonchalance um, is becoming more and more weird. Um, by the way, the, the reasons why Jack Persekian um, opposed the, 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 the boycott in his own favor are somewhat complicated. They were, um, yeah, I think, ask him. <laughs> <laughs> there was someone. I feel kind of funny asking my question after that question. If anybody has anything to say that follows up more directly, I'll pass the mic. Okay. <laughs> a funny question is fine. <laughs> well, uh, a friend of mine, Annie, has this idea that there's been a generational shift in use value where installation images now are really like the, the, the thing of desire and that uh, the single viewer has been, or the pleasure of the single viewer has been done away with because of the way that space needs to be constructed for installation shots to be the sexiest. And so I'm wondering if maybe this pummeling of installation shots that you were talking about at the beginning is maybe a consequence of this, or at the least like a further extraction of value or use value of <laughs> putting all that energy into setting up lights and cameras, or in another way, do you agree that post-exhibition circulation of images has somehow been at the expense of negotiating space or negotiating moving through space. Yes, absolutely. You, you, I mean, the, the, the last, the, the phrasing that you just shared with us was, that's exactly where I was trying to get to, and you just put it much more uh, elegantly than I managed to. Um, but yes, exactly. Um, it is at, um, it comes at a phenomenal, phenomenological expense. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that there's a lot of, it shouldn't be overestimated um, because that might be a little too, you know, uh, easy and smug and a little cynical. Um, I don't think that it's entirely the case that work is made for the installation shot, but I think that uh, the installation shot does have um, more of a weight and an influence within the whole uh, you know, production process than it than it should, um, and um, it's the the installation shot has been naturalized in a way that you know it's the same as the gate, the rhythm at which we move through an exhibition space. Um, it's no longer noticeable as such. Um, if you introduce contemporary art within um, a setting of people who, who don't deal with it on a daily basis and who, or who don't have a particular interest in it, um, you notice 
how an ins installation shot really requires a certain degree of literacy. It comes with a whole set of visual conventions that as a contemporary art uh, uh, professional you don't even notice anymore. Um, there's a whole language around the installation shot that allows certain people to recognize something and to a lot of uh, non-art folk it's just it's actually illegible which is really shocking every time you I, I notice that that is the case um, because I also in in I teach I teach at an art academy but I also teach in the department of uh, media studies um, at a college called Al Quds um, in a collaboration uh, with Bard College of New York and there, every now and then, in the context of various conversations, I introduce uh, an artwork by means of an installation shot because I just assume that it's the most didactic way to just give you a, a fleeting impression. And it's, it's, it's amazing to which extent um, you do need a particular kind of literacy uh, to take it apart and to analyze it. Um, and there's... Um, there's not much literature out there that deals with it. There's one uh, text by uh, Sohrab uh, Mohebi, which is called something like Caught Looking or Caught Watching, which addresses this. Um, and there's another, an older one by Jennifer Allen, which was published in Freeze, um, which is a very uh, polemical uh, proposal to uh, henceforth only publish installation shots that are black and white. Uh, so as to draw your attention to the fact that um, that you know it's not the real thing. We have time for one more question. If anyone has one, okay. Oh. Um, you did touch upon the um, uh, the idea of your um, audience, the the particular audience that. The, the, sp um, the particular audience that you would like to draw into the Taipei Biennial. And I would like to ask you if you could expand on it a little bit more. And you mentioned that you were targeting the older audience or who went to the previous one. Um, if you could just expand on it and, and maybe share with us whether or not you imagine the kind of audience that you would like to bring in to the biannual, because it's hard to imagine with these photos what kind of people attended it. Um, the, I mean, the, the, the weakness of the biennial was that at the end of the day, we didn't engage in that, except for exceptional moments, such as when you know, we had these, a certain, a small number of artists who are revisiting previous work, and this created a core of privileged exhibition goers, privileged in the sense that they were familiar with the previous versions and the present one. And this created what I've been calling a specific audience. Um, but these moments were few and far between. Um, and my uh, self-critique here is that there was no attempt to try to create any kind of specific audience. Um, for example, I mean, and, and this is not, it's not uncommon. It's not as if my colleagues are all running around uh, creating these very particular constituencies and here I am not doing my homework. Uh, on the contrary, that's actually um, the, the idea uh, behind uh, curating a biennial, but I think that it's not just reserved to the biennial context, um, is this assumption that uh, the more inclusive you are, uh, the better, um, and that if you reach out to, you know, uh, left, right, high, low, young, old, uh, what have you, uh, across the disciplines, um, across cultures, etc., um, that's when you're doing a good job. Um, and I, I take issue with that. I think that it's, um, it's, it's not, it's, it's pointless. <laughs> Um, I think that it's much more interesting to, for example, think about uh, Roger Burgle, who at the uh, Busan 
uh, Biennale decided to, his was a spirit of inclusivity and, uh, you know, it was very democratic in, in, in rhetoric and um, I'm not even sure I, I agree with all of his proposals, but I do really respect his attempt to turn it into an open call. Um, and it was almost uh, a form of crowdsourced curating where um, the doors were open to almost to anyone who had a suggestion. Um, and you could see this as another example of uh, curators rather brilliantly and light-footedly escaping a responsibility by not sharing their core concerns, but you know, outsourcing their decisions. Maybe it is, but I think it makes up for that uh, by virtue of, of proposing an entirely different way of thinking about audience, that if you do want to be as inclusive as that, then take it to its logical conclusion. Um, I also mentioned the Manifesto 6, where the audience was, uh, was very exclusive in the sense that the biennial consisted of a number of durational things which required a certain investment that only a very small number of people would be willing to make. Uh, pedagogical activities uh, such as uh, workshops, sem seminars, uh, lectures, etc. Um, but also uh, uh, print workshops and other very time-consuming processes. Does that, make, does that make more sense? I would be curious to know what Pablo wanted to ask. Well, I mean, it's not even, I, I, you just touched on like other biennials and the sort of the notion of curators just flown in and sort of dropped on something and then kind of exits out. And having experienced um, the Taipei Biennial um, uh, maybe about a month after its opening, um, it was a curious experience as, as someone dropping into something that I was like, oh, this is useless because I don't know what's going to happen. Like, this is going to happen for the next two years or there's something that's happening next week or I'm just here seeing all this remnant of stuff that isn't here. So I was curious if you could talk about your relationship to Taipei outside of the, the installation and opening of the biennial and whether or not there was a success or a failure in your view of how you participated in or enacted some sort of longevity within the city or the exhibition period of Biennial? Um, yes, very gladly. I'm just confused by, uh, because you were saying you arrived as a spectator. I arrived and as you a saw spectator, but like sometime in the middle of October or something, I just happened to be there for a day or two and it was sort of like, oh, there's this thing happening, but the real thing is at this other place, at this other time, or there's this proposal to do this thing. So, yeah, so much of it was not purely accessible in an exhibition context, or in, in, in the way that one might use to be seeing those, those types of projects. Um, yeah, because those, I think that the, that responds to a different set of of challenges. I think that um, your experience um, and the fact that you were kind of, um, you did not feel interpolated is what I've been uh, critiquing in terms of uh, a kind of withdrawal, like this overly hands-off kind of uh, approach um, of um, really uh, with, with this almost paranoid insistence on being anti-didactic along these Ranciarian lines that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and I think that was, a, that was a case of painting with a hammer. I'm not sure that that works very well in a, in a biennial context. Um, but when it comes to my own um, contribution in terms of uh, embedding the biennial within a longer uh, conversation that began before and continued after, which is what you, you were interested in. Um, it's very hard to say. It was, um, I will, I'll admit that it was, it was a little, um, 
uh, it was maybe an, 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 an instructive slap in the face to see that actually the subsequent biennial was such a um, strong polemical response to ours that kind of stood for so many things that we had critiqued so passionately. Uh, but then again, we had been just as uh, confrontational with the preceding one. Uh, so it's, it's ironic that, that we were so shocked. Um, I guess that, it, that that kind of curatorial conversation was one way of experiencing this, uh, uh, you know, this um, trajectory along a, a more extensive time scale than, you know, landing and leaving again. I, you know, to be, to be honest, even, even though I really believe in slowing things down, I believe in site specificity, I believe in extensive research, um, at the end of the day, I don't think um, this, curatory, this curating from an airplane accusation is as, um, or I don't think that that mode of working is as dangerous as its opposite. I think that the, the guilt-ridden attempt to account for local context by treating it as something that is fragile and that you need to, uh, you know, approach with extreme caution and, you know, your ears to the ground kind of thing. Um, I've, I've seen uh, so many examples of very, very condescending and uh, even destructive uh, attempts at being site-specific um, precisely to overcompensate this curing from an airplane accusation. Um, that um, I've, I've come to I've come to see this as 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 uh, as a lesser evil, as long as you can't make structural changes. Um, I'd rather see that. In an ideal world, I would rather see the whole apparatus uh, slow down uh, to an enormous degree. Uh, but as long as that can't happen. Um, I think that the local context can fend for itself. It's not, it's not like these ginseng roots or childhood traumas or uh, the local context. I mean, we experienced it ourselves, God knows, is very vocal and very confident when it needs to be. Um, does that make sense? Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I really appreciate your sharing your thoughts with us tonight about how we can work to produce a world rather than just create uh, critique one. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the screening tomorrow night. And I hope to see everybody there tomorrow at the AGO. So thank you for coming. Vem cá de dentro A nossa